Thank you, Robert. Thank you for uh, organizing this event. So, boy, I was thinking that it's challenging to give the last talk of the day since everybody's uh, tired. Now I gotta match the level of interest of the previous talk. So, let's see how I do. I hope you guys uh, uh, li like what you hear from us. So I'm Costin Yanko. I'm at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. And I want to talk up, uh, to you about our uh, sort of quantum uh, optimization infrastructure. So this is a project I started uh, five years ago, probably. It's been mostly supported by uh, the U.S. Department of Energy Office of Science. And uh, my background is systems, system programming languages. And I got to say, this was a very entertaining travel, and it took us in some very unexpected places. So this is the talent behind uh, all of our results. One part of the secret sources that we are highly interdisciplinary, so we have HPC, quantum information science, domain science, physics, math experience. We also span uh, terms of career development from senior scientist to undergrad. And in terms of psychological skills, from enthusiasm and good skepticism, let's put it this way. So this keeps us, keeps us grounded somewhat. Um, what we have is a circuit manipulation and optimization infrastructure, which is port very portable right now. Supports all the gates existing. Uh, I think also uh, it's going to be uh, relevant in the fault tolerant regime. What we can do is, uh, oh, on top of that, we can support high level abstractions. Uh, high dimension, sorry. Multi qubit gates, qubits, qubits, and so on. And uh, we can manipulate all these things in different mathematical uh, encodings. And we can very easily go from one to the other and compose uh, very powerful transformation workflows. We also have our own uh, type of uh, error mitigation and uh, circuit approximation. And what I'm going to talk to you about is how you use this infrastructure for uh, circuit optimization and then how you could use it for hardware and hardware and design exploration. We have a software release. We released it about one year ago. The code is uh, very good, very good quality, almost production ready. We had uh, a lot of interest in it, about 200,000 more or more downloads within a year, contains technologies that we recognize with the various best, best paper awards. We have a healthy uh, set of users. I listed some of, some of them there. The point is we have uh, users that belong to the national labs and uh, build qubits and are heavy HPC, use, uh, HPC users. We have academic users and we also have uh, companies that are using our software. Uh, we work hard to make the, the the software portable uh, runs from a laptop to a supercomputer. We're actually very heavy supercomputer users. And I want to take this opportunity to, th to thank uh, the National Energy Research Scientific Computing Center, first, which uh, gave us access to running millions of hours uh, of CPU and GPU hours to tune uh, our methods and uh, our workflows. Uh, so we work hard to make this software portable, and we also have a very good example of the strategy here, how HPC can help with the quantum development. Uh, we took a lot of time uh, providing high-level support for our abstractions. We have a Pythonic interface. It looks like every other company's or software package. Uh, if you don't care, if you want to do circuit optimization, we have some turnkey functionality to just Ask, you give it your circuit and just ask for some predefined machine configuration. The power comes from uh, configuring your workflow and having very fine interactions between these transformations and tuning and having feedback directed transformations and so on. So you can reconfigure a machine, you can reconfigure the gate set in terms of mathematical objects, and we have very fine grain control over the transformation workflow. If you really want to use this, we have a tutorial, we give it at conferences. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of very good Jupyter notebooks. We'll take you from beginner to expert in a minute, let's say. Okay. Uh, it's actually a very good... Uh, so, by the way, my collaborator, Ed Unis, is here. He built a lot of this infrastructure. He is uh, the engine behind <laughs> a lot of these uh, achievements. And uh, if you have questions, particular questions, talk to him, yeah? So now, to the more uh, entertaining part. Uh, if you, at the domain, uh, at the domain science levels, you think about uh, your quantum programs in some mathematical encoding, and you'll end up with a Hamiltonian, some unitary, or some uh, poly operator encoding. 
At the other end, at the hardware level, you think your program is going to look as a concrete quantum circuit. So when I talk about these things, we talk about function and uh, structure. Function is what the program does, structure is how it does it, yeah? Uh, our, and usually tools, yeah, usually tools translate between these two levels, yeah? The, 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 we, we do the same thing, our power comes from the fact that we use a sort of a unified uh, program representation, which is parameterized, uh, that unifies these two end, 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 end points of the development cycle, and uh, at this level, Okay, at this level, at this level of this uh, parameterized uh, representation, on the left shows we support a lot of parameterized gates, uh, qubits and uh, qubits, qubits or multi-qubit gates, uh, both in uh, parameterized encodings or parameterized encodings or uh, fixed gates. Uh, on the right hand side shows that we allow you to translate parts of your circuits, in any part of your circuit, into uh, different representations, mathematical representations, unitary or some uh, poly operator encoding. And you can manipulate freely between this at any time during the transformation. At the base of our uh, infrastructure and of our, most of our transformations is this uh, primitive operation of uh, instantiation. So you have a target program, you have a temp parameterized template, Numerical instantiation is solving numerically with a numerical optimizer for the parameters in the template in such a way that it implements your uh, target program. The objective function for the optimization is reconfigurable. You can plug in whatever you want. We use mostly Hilbert Schmidt distances. Uh, this particular primitive enables us to have very complex workflows and transformations. And what the, the other, so the generic way we do things, you can think about it as a unitary synthesis. So the idea here is consider all the possible circuits that implement all the possible programs, and you can enumerate them in some programmatic way. So over here we enumerate them in terms of uh, depth. And then uh, if you want to do transformations, uh, any transformation is pretty much a walk on this tree. Yeah? If you want to do circuit generation or synthesis, you start from the, from the root, you start growing your circuit, and you walk towards the leaves. If you already have a circuit and you want to optimize it, for example, delete gates, you start from the leaves, and you walk backwards towards the root. And uh, the working strategy is the algorithm, and you can put over here uh, any objective function. So we can optimize gate count, we can optimize for, for, optimize for depth, we can also handle heterogeneous gate mixes, we have heuristics for defects, patterns, and uh, so on. Uh, in terms of the software, we have uh, a set of direct unitary synthesis or instantiation algorithms that can handle increasing circuit sizes from 3 to 12-ish qubits, let's say. And well, with this type of algorithms, we have uh, workflows, which we have sort of canned workflows, but the idea there is we we know what type of transformations should go into a, into a goal-directed workflow, but you can customize and have feedback directed uh, transformations. So we do optimization, resynthesis and gate deletion, we do mapping, we have uh, approximations, we can do gate set targeting and so on. And I think I'm going to give you examples uh, for most of them later. Now, uh, this direct unitary instantiation has scalability limit. We can handle right now realistically 12 ish qubits. We can probably scale it up to, let's say, 20. The point is that there's always going to be a bigger circuit. So, our strategy there is uh, the, it's a divide conquer strategy. We have a big circuit, we chop it into small pieces, we uh, transform each piece individually, and we have strategies to put it back. And so far, this worked very well in practice. We have demonstrations at about 2000, for about 2,000 qubit uh, circuits. We could go higher because it's embarrassingly parallel. The one of my points is there are no interesting programs at this point that uh, realistically use uh, more than 2,000 qubits. It's very hard to generate these programs. Uh, doing what we do, we, we transform the circuits a lot, so we also have support for circuit verification. Uh, in order to enable this, the idea is you need to understand how the errors compose with respect to your objective function. So we use additive, uh, additive metrics. In, in happily, Hilbert Schmidt is additive. Uh, so now, 
You take the circuit, you partition it, you transform, you put something back, let's say it has an error uh, with respect to the initial partition. Uh, you can add the errors up if the number is, is good, you're done. If not, we offer you a direct, uh, another uh, verification strategy. So you can partition your circuit in the biggest uh, piece you can simulate. And then we do the software assembly, reassembly, uh, operation. And at the end, you can actually simulate the, result, the resulting partitions, and this gives you a much tighter bound on the error. So in our transformations or in the papers we publish, we usually target 10 to minus 10 uh, Hilbert-Schmidt distance, and most of the times we actually exceed that by a lot. So the first use uh, of this tool is for circuit optimization. And I think you've seen this a lot before. There's a lot, uh, by the way, these graphs are, these slides are about three years old. A lot, of, a lot has changed things, but in the big picture, not a whole lot has changed things. Let's put it this way. So there's a lot of uh, qubit technologies out there. Each cube, uh, each, some of these technologies have uh, different gate sets. Let's put it this way. So one of the goals is portability. Uh, no matter what all these uh, technologies, if they run circuits, ultimately the number of gates or the circuit depth is a direct measure of the circuit performance. So these are one, two of our goals, yeah? Uh, now, hardware being noisy and the technologies being what they are, the resources are actually constrained in, the, in this uh, uh, processors. This again is an uh, older graph, but numbers haven't changed that much since. So this, this, this first column says uh, there is a limit on the number of gates you can actually run on hardware imposed by the chip coherence time. The graph in the, the column in the middle says since errors accumulate uh, in time, and as shown by, the, by some randomized benchmarking graph there, that limit is actually tighter than the, the limit uh, imposed by the coherence time. And this column here says if you run long circuits on hardware, you're gonna get junk output. Or if you wanna be polite, what do they call it? A maximal in mixed state, okay? Uh, so in our, in our view, resource optimization is both a performance enhancer and the capability provider. And I think it's gonna be like this for a while. You want the shorter circuit that fits on your hardware. Oh, I was gonna, I ruined the surprise here. How many people know uh, how many CNATs are in a three qubit quantum Fourier transform circuit in the optimal one? All right, six CNATs, okay? And uh, this is an algorithm where we have an analytical, uh, an analytical method to generate optimal circuits for uh, all to all uh, topology, okay? Now, if you wanna, if your topology is restricted, so you don't have uh, that, that triangle all to all, and you have a line on three qubits, we're going to use an optimal mapping algorithm. In this case, we're using OLSQ. It's going to insert a swap. This translates to three CNATs, and you end up with a nine CNAT circuit. Yeah? Turns out that you can do better. So if we, if we uh, just take our topology aware synthesis algorithm, and uh, we, we synthesize to a line, we already get a six CNAT circuit. So nine to six is already a respectable gain. Yeah? Turns out you can do even better. If you do not care about uh, the input-output order of your qubits, and you actually don't in some cases, because it's like a two-line Python script to fix it, and we do our trick again, we end up with a circuit with five CNATs, yeah? So to my knowledge, I, I think this is the best QF, three qubit QFT you can get, and you can get this from our type, uh, you can get this from this type of tools. So we call this uh, permutation-aware synthesis. This shows you how it works, doesn't really matter how it works at this point. Uh, the idea here is when you use a traditional circuit mapper, it's going to insert gates in the circuit. Subsequent optimization passes are likely to not be able to remove some of these gates. For us, it's only math, yeah? We put some permutation matrices there. We do matrix multiplication. All the communication is absorbed in the math. So you can think about us doing communication with uh, line and column matrix shuffling, uh, uh, yeah? Uh, turns out that this generalizes very well in practice. So we have an approach called permutation-aware mapping. 
Again, you take a big circuit, you chop it into small pieces. Now, for each piece, we're going to generate all the input-output permit uh, solutions for all the, all the input-output permutations mapped on all the possible uh, topology embeddings for three qubits. Yeah? And then we have a generalization of the Sabre algorithm, which basically what it does is when it uh, tries to place two blocks, it's going to choose the implementations that minimize both the depth of the particular blocks together with the communication they need to insert between blocks to stitch the, the two blocks together. So this worked very well in practice. Uh, so over here we show uh, our mappers for a set of circuits which are uh, described on the x-axis and what we plot here is uh, the number of CNATs in the solution relative to the Sabre baseline, which is a map, which is the mapper we, we started with. In all, most of the graphs I'm going to show you lower is better. And uh, I don't know what this color is called, but our results are usually described in that color. Uh, so this, so now in this graphic, compare against the uh, mappers. In this case, we, we took uh, the MQTQ map algorithm. Also compare about uh, with the Kiskit and Ticket, and also compare against, against ourselves uh, the pure synthesis algorithms. And as you can do, we have a very respectable uh, synod reduction for this type of problems. The other thing we can do very, very well uh, is the following. If your logical topology in the circuit is already restricted and the hardware has uh, richer connect connectivity, a lot of the existing compilers are going to treat that the circuit as already legal and not going to do a lot of transformation. In our case, with the synthesis, again, we do very well uh, and we are able to reduce uh, the depth. And this is of particular interest at this point, I think, to the trap tie people because they can do all, do all the connectivity on their hardware. Okay. The other thing we do very well is uh, transpilation. And in this case, you have a circuit expressed in one gate set. You want to run an architecture with a completely different gate set. So you have to translate the, the circuits between the two architectures. Again, we, we throw synthesis at it. The algorithm doesn't uh, matter that much at this point. Uh, but uh, some conclusions that came uh, out of this, uh, this study. So by the way, in the, so we have a paper. In the paper, we show translations to all the native gates that are used by some hardware that exists these days. Uh, so one lesson was that given the existing uh, two qubit gates, the two qubit native gate sets, not all compilers support all, the, all types of transformations. And the other thing we do well here, and not a lot of compilers do, is we can generate code for hybrid gate sets, okay? Okay, so where, where do the improvements come from? So it turns out that if you look at the approaches used right now, compilers use a one-to-one -one, uh, mapping rule. So you have an input, input to qubit gate, you come up with an analytical rule to translate it to the, your output gate, and then they put the pattern all over the places on the circuit. In our case, we, we throw synthesis at it that we can do much better. So th this graph shows you that uh, we take circuits in, in CNOTs and we translate them to the, to the CPAM or in the Google architecture. And it looks like we can do, this graph says uh, we can do better than <coughs> circuit this, yeah? And uh, the other thing to note from here, which is going to become apparent, apparent next, is uh, we change, so if you look at the survey results, we change sort of the relative ratio of the gates, uh, CCAM or to CNAT gates. Ours is a lot more even than the, the, the results produced by the, the CERC compiler. So one, if you take one message and if you want to use our synthesis-based approach, uh, we can do configurable global optimizations on your circuit or program. And that gives us a lot of opportunity to provide the more resource-efficient circuits, yeah? It's a set of papers, if you want to read or you care, and explain a lot of the algorithms and the approaches we have in the software. Um, the other thing we do is we can, we can handle higher dimension objects. And what enabled this, uh, this work is uh, our domain-specific optimizer. So it turns out that if you use off-the-shelf optimizers for transforming quantum circuits, uh, they have limitations in terms of scalability and the number of parameters they can handle. 
uh, so, by the way, our most favorite optimizer is the Google Series optimizer. There's robust scales. So we, we are very happy with it until we did this work, yeah? So, uh, by the way, if you're not from the US, this is a traditional DOE accomplishment slide, so. Uh, all right, so what we did here is uh, we used the tensor network formulation for the problem, um, which, first of all, enables us to plug an arbitrary size unit A as a tensor and manipulate it directly, and is very amenable to GPU acceleration and parallelization, yeah? And uh, so what it gives you is illustrated here. So the solid lines are the running time, the blue line on the x-axis you have the qubit numbers. Uh, the blue line shows the scalability of series, and uh, the green line shows the scalability of the implementation of all algorithm on CPUs, and we already get the order of two orders of magnitude that the large circuit size is. The baseline is our uh, JAX-based implementation, the GPU-based implementation, and that gives us a larger number of qubits, about three orders of magnitude performance improvement. The other thing that it does on, the, on this y-axis you have, you have the success rate plotted, and series falls down here while ours, ours still goes, yeah? So this is a very good domain-specific optimizer which enables us to push the envelope of the circuit optimization. Uh, the other thing we do is uh, we support q -trist. This was a very nice, it's not, it's not done by us. This was a very fascinating physical experiment. Doesn't matter what it is. The point is, this is a single q gate. Gives you an idea how complicated it is uh, to support and transform this type of gates. And the other lesson from, uh, from, from this work is the following. So communicating with physicists, HPC4 communicating with physicists, came up multiple times. There's a disconnect there. So with this work, and so in this particular experience, I was uh, leading the software deployment effort on, on our Berkeley quantum test deck. And the physicists were, well, we do synthesis, we don't care that much. And then I showed them how we can do q for this particular experiment, which turned out that they spent months computing things by, by hand, yeah? So we did this in five minutes, and since then they are very happy clients, and they seek collaborations with us. And they also made an effort to, to start learning to talk to us, okay? So we understand each other. So the lesson is, if you give them something that is of direct use to them, they'll talk to you, okay? Uh, the other thing uh, that this type of approach is, uh, enables us to start exploring the design spaces. And in particular, I'm going to show you how we explore uh, the hardware design space uh, with, with, with synthesis. So, assuming that, I think you can already ask this question. I have, a, I have an algorithm, what hardware instance should I run my algorithm? Yeah? Or, you are a hardware designer, what can I do to my machine to make it uh, more competitive? And that, uh, here's what we do here. The, the main idea is, if you take a circuit and, and uh, you do the optimal transpilation, you would end up with uh, profiles like this. On the x-axis, we have algorithms, on, and we plot the circuit depth and the gate count, and we show ratios. The ratio of the target gate set with, with respect to the reference, some reference in our circuit. And you, have a, you have the gate set we transpile to over here. So this, this graph already shows that uh, gates has have different expressivity, yeah? The other thing that this graph shows, so there is a usually correlation between gate and depth. In some cases, we see another uh, anti-correlation. And depth, depth was already important to understand, that depth and gate parallels, because of crosstalk. So what we do is uh, we build this uh, Hardware, hardware performance models, and uh, the first model we use is actually the very simple model, is the, the model from the Google Supremacy paper, which they, with, which they show that it actually uh, shows, uh, it's, a, it's a good indicator of the final circuit fidelity. So this model, it says uh, the final fidelity of my circuit is the product of the fidelity of the one and two qubit gates to the power of the gate count. Okay? Um, so, I'm going to make some inferences now. The point is that I, I dare to make these inferences because we, we use a procedure that generates, I think, the shortest implementation of any algorithm available on the particular hardware instance. 
And I think this is very important because that's what we can do, what, what, what our tools can do in terms of representing that particular class of outlines, okay? So don't throw uh, tomatoes, in particular for a hardware designer. This is the first time we show this graph. We, we uh, got these results about uh, a week ago. So what do we do here? We ask the question, uh, which two qubit gate can provide uh, higher fidelity for, uh, for, for two machines, yeah? And we use a algorithmic world I'm gonna show you later what that is. So on the x-axis here, we plot the CZ fidelity. On the y-axis, we plot the CTAMOR fidelity with respect to the CZ fidelity. And we solve the models, and we solve the model each time for a fixed one qubit fidelity. In this case, is 0.999, yeah? And we obtain this type of surfaces, which, which says, for this workload in this region, okay, CCAMOR, the CCAMOR uh, processor is going to be better. There's nothing you can do to your case set or your CPU architecture. In this blue region, depends on the algorithm or the circuit. In this uh, red region, the CZ-based architecture is better, yeah? So the CCAMOR-based implementation or hardware cannot do anything to, to win in that region. So this is already, I think, is already useful. High level, but useful. Uh, the other thing we do is if we start uh, increasing the one qubit fidelity, uh, the algorithm-specific region shrinks, okay? While you reach asymptotically one, and then we can ask the, the question, uh, the following question, when do one qubit gates start mattering again, yeah? Then we can build this type of graph, which works like this. So on the x-axis, we have the ratio of two qubit, uh, two qubit, the average ratio, you uh, know, the average, the ratio of the average number of two qubit gates for the workload on machine A, uh, with respect to the, the same number on machine B, yeah? And then we solve the models uh, and determine the threshold qubit, one qubit fidelity where one machine becomes better than the other. And this gives us a way to assess the importance of one qubit gates uh, independent of the two qubit gate fidelity. And this graph shows the following. So if my ratio, my two qubit, my ratio, the ratio of my two qubit gates is between these two numbers, the one qubit gate count matters. Okay. Oh, so by the way, so we also plot the threshold, uh, one, uh, every, the average one is, is uh, one qubit gate fidelity here, which we got from uh, the pub publicly available data. So uh, we showed the gate sets here, the, the gate sets that are compared here. So now the the points, the point, the, the points, the the gate set comparisons that lie in this region uh, say the following. Uh, the one qubit gate count matters here, and if I want to improve my architecture with respect to another or with myself, I can mark with the one qubit fidelity. And that is this is because the threshold we, we solve is lower than the, is higher than the average next to the other. Uh, if you fall into this region, there's nothing you can do. It doesn't matter how much you improve your one qubit fidelity, your performance is not going to improve. So I think this type of inferences, assuming that you can trust them, and we, we, you, got, you need to understand the methodology very well and pass master because you haven't published this data, I think it's very useful to hardware designers, for example. So the other thing we can do well, and I think this is the power of our tools, we can enable approximation of, uh, sorry, we can enable exploration of uh, algorithm design spaces. So the first thing we, we do is we can build circuit approximations. We introduce this for this, te uh, this technique for both circuit optimization and error mitigation within this. But I think it's a lot more powerful uh, technique, and I, I'm going to show you later why. Uh, the other thing we do is we, we can use synthesis to discover algorithm generators. And I'm going to show you two examples. So this, this particular paper shows you how to discover build, uh, building blocks in a collection of circuits without any domain-specific knowledge, okay? This other piece of work shows you how to discover building blocks in, uh, algo in circuits for a particular class of algorithm using domain-specific knowledge. And I have a strong feeling that going forward, this type of approach will, dis will discover somehow building blocks for circuits or algorithms is the way to, to scale compilation, okay? Because you can build databases of, of these templates, and then you can, uh, you have, can, have, can have strategies to have scalable compilation and optimization for, for the QPUs. 
So the first question is uh, approximation. So why, why would you want to use an approximate circuit? So first of all, an approximation is you have a target program, you have a target unitary, or you have a target program represented by a target unitary, and then uh, you have another unitary that's some epsilon distance, small distance from the target unitary. And maybe if you can build a program from the, for, for the, if you can build a circuit for the second unitary, maybe that circuit has, let's say, has a fewer number of gates, okay? And it turns out that this is actually a good technique for, uh, at, least, at least during the NIST era. So what we show here is the following. So the algorithm we're looking at is a transverse field icing model. And this is a Hamiltonian simulation. Uh, the property of this type of circuits, so they simulate the evolution of a system with time steps. And the property of these uh, this circuits is that their depth grows linearly with the, uh, with the time step. So this is shown here. So th this is uh, this grad color gradient is the number of synapses in the circuit. So as you can see, then at, at the 20, 20th time step, the, at the circuit depth, the exact circuit depth should be 50 synapses. That's what this uh, the color uh, gradient says. We plot the the expected uh, the expected value, and we also plot the value of the exact circuit run on noisy hardware, which is this yellow line. As you can see. If you run the exact circuit, you get very bad results. Uh, and then we plot for each, uh, for each time interval, we plot the solution uh, provided by uh, approximations of the exact circuit at that depth with the various, uh, at various depth. There. And as you can see, the point of this graph is all the circuits that actually give you something that is close to the hardware performance are within the, this region, no matter what, and even if the exact length is about 50, 50 synapses here. So this means when noisy hardware, this, this type of approximation may have a chance of giving you good results. So based on this observation, we, we went and uh, provided a robust way to generate approximations for large-scale circuits, which validated on hardware very well. So the whole idea here is the following. You have a circuit, you have a program, yeah? A target program, and you want to build an approximation with some process distance, yeah? If you take one sample, the result is not gonna be good. But if you find a way to sort a sample uniformly that space of processes uh, around your target process, uh, the average behavior of those processes may approximate very well your input circuit. Um, so based on that, this is our processing pipeline, yeah? We take the circuit, we chop it into small blocks. We, for each block, we generate a, a series of approximations. And then the circuit source is in how you put this, you put this back together. And this uh, cartoon shows you the principle here. So if, if, I, if I build two big samples, if I put sample one of a sub-block in the first sample, in the, in the other big sample, I want, I want to choose a, a, a sample of the smaller block that it is, that obeys some geometrical inequality. So think about it as a triangle inequality. And this, this uh, uh, gives me a way in which I, I sample uniformly the, the process space, okay? If you, if you validate, so we validated this on hardware and uh, in, with noisy simulation, so this graph here shows you if you do this, this type of technique, we can reduce the depth of the circuits. The circuits are here. Uh, a lot, yeah? Uh, this graph here shows that uh, there's a price to pay in terms of uh, depth reduction because you need to, to run a larger number of samples, but in this particular case, which again is a Hamiltonian simulation circuit where the depth grows linearly, the price is not very high. Yeah? Uh, th these two graphs are actually very important. Uh, this graph says that if you actually measure the uh, distance of the, the circuit output from the ground truth, you get uh, all, all the distances are smaller than 10 to minus 2. A lot of them are, or some of them are 10 to minus 14 and so on. Um, this graph shows you the behavior on hardware. So this is a four-spin four Heisenberg model, so it's a four-cubic circuit. Time steps, and you can see our approximation track, tracks the ground truth, while the exact circuits, they just, they just fold, okay? The important thing of this uh, graph, the, one, the point I want to make is this distance is quite low, yeah? So you shouldn't expect, so whenever I show this graph to people, they say, well, it's not 10 to minus 14. In practice, given domain constraints, this distance, quite low. 
and if you talk to physicists, ex experimentalists, and uh, application people, they're gonna give you some very low numbers for, for this type of exercises or transformation. Okay, so. So far, this has been empirical. Uh, last week, so my collaborator Mohan Saravar at Sandia told me that we finally have a soundness proof. And if that validates on hardware, I think we're going to have a very nice and powerful way of doing uh, <coughs> both error mitigation and very robust circuit approximation, which is good for optimization, but long term. So, by the way, so if that works, my what I'm going to try to do is, for example, replicate the IBM quantum utility experiment, hopefully without the zero noise extrapolation, or see how much we can push it before zero noise extrapolation kicks in. Yeah? So if that works, it's going to be a very powerful technique. The other uh, thing I, I wish to get out of this uh, type of uh, approxim building robust approximations, I think if we do that, we can answer quantitatively a question that it's going to become more and more important, which is, I have my domain science, I know something about the result I expect there, yeah, it's a number, so, okay. I have no way to control and communicate this to the quantum, uh, to the quantum tool chain and, to and control the transformation in the tool chain in such a way that I can use those constraints. So, we're going to try, so basically what we're going to try is relate process distance to output distance numerically and be able to compare things and control. If we do that, I think that's a very powerful thing. Uh, now, the other thing we do, and uh, I think has long legs, is uh, learning circuit generating templates. Uh, so the question was, can we discover structure in circuits without domain science knowledge? Yeah? So what we did is we took a bunch of algorithms, we chopped them into three qubit pieces, um, and then we started enumerating a set of templates programmatically. Yeah? Uh, and then we run a brute force search, we try to instantiate every input block to, a, to one of these templates. Yeah? And then we ask the question how many of these templates implement a particular algorithm? Okay? So it turns out that you see a lot of structure there, and that is very surprising. Yeah? So uh, the first lesson is that these patterns occur for, for a particular algorithm class. If you take all the circuits of across multiple scales, you can discover a very small set of generating patterns. Yeah? So this graph says if I take all the TFIM circuits, or a bunch of TFIM circuits at the different width, I can discover three templates that implement 99% of all of them. Yeah? And uh, number one, for example, some circuits have a very high ratio of, uh, of a single template. Yeah? So this is very encouraging if you want to exploit structure in circuits and accelerate compilation, mapping, and all sorts of uh, expensive techniques uh, based, on, uh, based on this uh, approach. The other lesson here, or the other thing we observed is, uh, so these patterns, if you look at algorithm composition, these patterns survive algorithm composition. What this graph says is if I look at a short on 24 qubits, which contains uh, a lot of instances of uh, QFT12, I, I discover a lot of templates, and what this means is the results are somewhat independent of the partitioning technique we used. Okay? So this means there's some structure in there which can be discovered, and we can probably, if we look even more and more, we can do a lot better. Yeah? And refine these templates to something that mean, has some operational meaning to the domain science, let's say, yeah? for the mathematical formulation of the algorithm. Uh, we looked at we looked also at uh, this uh, the unitaries we fed to the to this process. Turns out they are sort of low dimensionality. So the three qubit unitary you have under 28 numbers in there. Uh, if you use 32 per, uh, components, you can identify a very high uh, percentage of these unitaries. Uh, based on this, we build a model that can predict. You give it a unitary, predicts a template. This is the confusion matrix, it does quite well, let's say. Uh, so now, how can you use this in practice? So we use it in practice to accelerate our synthesis. We take the circuit, we chop it, we look at the unitary, we, we predict the, the template that's gonna, intro, uh, that's gonna implement it. Uh, this is the workload, and so this is the same workload we used for the hardware, for the hardware comparisons. So, 
this, this workload produces that, that type of result. My point is you can plug in your favorite workload and you can, uh, you can get the same type of uh, comparisons if you want. Uh, this works well. This graph say, hey, we get a lot of speed up with no accuracy loss. Okay. Um, and if we do this, uh, the, so this, what this graph shows, shows you the error of the output. So this, the, the error is bounded here. The point of this graph is our error is quite good, even if we didn't try very hard to improve it. So the worst here is 10 to minus 7 for sure. You may accept it, you may not accept it. It's not clear because we, this doesn't give you an indication on the error on the output. In, my, in our experience, this is a very good, uh, good very good, uh, let's call it approximation. Well, it looks almost like the exact same, okay? Uh, so the other thing we can do is, or the, the other type of question we can answer is, uh, can I discover circuit structure? For, a, for an algorithm, if I can exploit the domain, uh, the domain knowledge. Uh, so again, so this, this work works for uh, IC models and XY models, transverse field or not, yeah? So uh, the results show here, so again, this is a Hamiltonian simulation. Depth grows linearly with a time step. We, we've been able to discover constant depth implementations of the circuits. Uh, if you do that, on, and if you, if you run the linearly growing implementation on hardware, the green line shows you get bad results. If you run the constant depth, shows that it tracks the, this graph shows that it tracks the, the ground route, yeah? So here's the story here, uh, how, how we did that. So we were helping these people to compile or trying to optimize these linearly growing circuits. Uh, and our collaborator, Ethan Smith, was compiling all these circuits. So we, he had a bunch of Circuits that were linear, linear depth increasing, yeah? So after a while, he compiled a lot of them. He observed that, hey, you know what? Asymptotically, they will have the same depth, give or take a couple of kids, yeah? So then he said, hey, what if we take uh, one of these and see if we can instantiate all the other plan, all the other, all, all the algorithm, all the time steps? And lo and behold, it did, yeah? So that, at that point, we had a empirical solution for empirical template that we thought it can implement uh, all the time steps for the, this type of problems, yeah? So that got the chemists and the domain science, uh, the, sorry, they're not chemists, material scientists, very excited, yeah? And then they went out and uh, figured it out analytically, and the end result is they came out with an analytic generator that's very scalable and can generate uh, constant depth circuits for any IC model, an XY model, uh, transverse field or not. What they, they look at the patterns and the repetitions, and I think they used our templates also to, to give them some guidance. They came up with this notion of a match cake. Now every time step is, repeat, is represented by a repeating pattern of the match gates. They figured out, uh, so this is the match gate uh, unit, unitary. They figured out rules for uh, symbolic simplification of this match gate these batch gates, and the point is the constant, the constant depth circuit that can implement all these TFIM uh, algorithms is uh, quadratic in the number of qubits. That's its depth. So that's a very good uh, result. Now, these models are arguably simplish, but probably and hopefully we can repeat this type of procedure for more complicated models. So I think uh, Eisenberg models in particular, they are useful and challenging to, I don't think anybody knows how to generate constant depth of circuits for them at this point. All right, so in summary, we have a, I think it's a useful uh, software infrastructure. I haven't talked anything about it, but uh, we also do Clifford plastic gates. So we, uh, apparently, this is a new package. Apparently we can do very well. We do good for algorithm and design exploration. We actually have a very nice uh, work where we, we can do uh, QBT ratio with mid circuit measurement. I'm going to publish it soon. We st already started looking at the uh, distributed quantum computing and big, big ticket open problems. We have no idea how to express domain constraints with respect to the quantum implementations. So, well, this is something I want to start looking at, but this is a big problem. The other big problem is. Uh, Scalable circuit generation from uh, the domain science specifications. 
I, I don't think anybody can generate those. So our experience is uh, you cannot generate a meaningful circuit higher than, I don't know, 2,000 or more qubits. What happens is uh, you, get, you start getting numerical errors. Number one and number two, there's a lot of techniques that delete low angle gates. And at, at, the, at the scale, you may get, uh, you may lose whatever. You may, you may start generating approximate, so, uh, approximate solutions by, uh, without knowing, yeah? And the other thing is uh, we are big users of HPC. If things go how they go, and we need to run the shortest circuit on, uh, on the hardware instances at the qubit concurrencies, they're going to come. It's probably going to take a lot of hardware to actually optimize. Yeah. Even that. So it's either you optimize on the fly, or you got to run a lot of offline searches to generate these kind of templates, yeah? and then build a database of partial solutions to things. And after that, we can do pattern matching. But I think it's going to take, we're going to churn a lot of uh, compute hours. And I think that's it. Thank you. Questions? Thank you.